We're just gonna dive right into this because I have no idea how to properly start this video. And to be honest with you, I've been pretty anxious about making it, which is why we've been absent for a while, why it's taken so long to put out, because there's so much to cover and I wanna make sure that I do it in a way that is optimally thorough and digestible and also because very few people actually talk about this issue. So watch it in parts if you have to, just make sure that you watch the whole thing because I think that this will end up being one of the most important videos that we've ever done. So I'll just start off by saying, there is no greater threat to the future of our country than pornography. Not socialism, not the left, not big government, pornography. And I'll prove that to you if you lend me your attention for however long this takes us to get through. Please bear with me, hear me out. But to summarize what I mean by that before we get into all the data and explanations, if you imagine any conflict that you have in your life or that we face as a society, you have to think of it as a zero-sum game. You have to focus on yourself just as much and perhaps even more than you're focusing uh, on your enemy. Like, it's not enough to say, well, you know, they're stupid, they're, they're incompetent, they don't know what they're doing, there's no way they could ever make that work or be successful, because if you're not bringing anything to the table to push back against that, to stand your ground, then it really doesn't matter how foolish you think your enemy is. Eventually, they'll conquer you, because any ground that they have gained is necessarily ground that you have seeded. It is a zero-sum game. And the reason this ties into pornography is that pornography is literally making us mentally ill. It is making us depressed. It is making us weak. It's making us numb and pacified. It's making us more impulsive and therefore more susceptible to propaganda. And again, we're going to get into all the data behind this in great detail. But the point is that if you had something like that, something that was literally neurochemically breeding mental illness in practically the entire male population, do you think that those men would ever be able to successfully push back against the left, against socialism, against a big government, against anything, let alone feel as though their lives have meaning? No. Now, what has happened to our men in the last 15 years is unprecedented throughout the history of the world. We're the guinea pigs. And what we're finding out is that the results of this are catastrophic for our brains, for our lives, for our society as a whole. And you can laugh at this if you want to, but it doesn't make it any less true. And again, I've got a mountain of data to back this up if you'll just bear with me. But first, I just want you to ask yourself a question, which is just very simply, am I addicted to pornography? You know, we're going to get into the nature of addiction later, but we know that 98% of men have accessed pornography in the last six months and that 80% of men have accessed accessed it within the last week, ask yourself this question. When's the last time I went over a month without watching pornography or even two weeks? Your answer doesn't necessarily mean that you're addicted, but you know, if you were addicted, then the next question would be, okay, is this a bad addiction to have? Am I doing damage to myself or is it exactly the same as people who just like to look at pictures of puppies all the time, which is an actual argument that we'll address later from the pornography addicts. But for now, if you're a young man who watches pornography and you just so happen to feel depressed, to feel unmotivated to do things, even things that you used to enjoy, you feel socially anxious, you feel as though you have no control in your life, maybe you seem to have some form of erectile dysfunction, even if you're very young, maybe you don't get morning wood anymore, uh, maybe you've had some encounters with women and you weren't able to keep it up the whole time, or maybe you need to fantasize about pornography or watch it at the same time in order to sustain yourself. Sort of vulgar, so I apologize for that, but you know, maybe you're not even interacting with women. Maybe Maybe they're not even as appealing to you. You don't feel very good about yourself. You don't have self-confidence. You have trouble concentrating on things. You feel numb in everyday life. If any of this sounds like you, I need you to consider that your use of pornography is likely causing or at the very least amplifying some of these problems. And we can prove it scientifically, empirically, logically, anecdotally, whichever way you'd like. And I know this is an uncomfortable conversation to have, believe me, you should see some of the emails I get about this stuff, but this is the most important conversation to be having because there is no greater threat to the well-being of the country than pornography. Because after a few generations of men experiencing the symptoms that we just listed, the country will collapse. Like it simply can't survive that. No society has ever faced anything like this before. And if you care about this country, then you have to be disciplined. What do we always say? A disciplined mind is an effective mind. Aristotle said, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies, for the hardest victory is over self. He also said, we are what we repeatedly do. And pornography is an attack on man, and by extension, an attack on the family, and by extension, an attack on the society. And if we don't reverse course soon, our civilization simply will not survive. Like, we will be conquered by our enemies. Men who came before you didn't live like this, and you were never supposed to, because pornography literally causes all of these problems. And we know this because of what we can prove that it does to your neurochemistry, and because of what we can prove that it does to your being. Like, like, just because it's hard to conduct an experiment with the proper controls because of how widespread this issue is and how inherently private it is doesn't mean that you get to be like, no, this has been debunked. Sex positive psychologist told me so. No. And even that aside, the studies that we do have that explore this with the proper methodology all align with our position. So your opinion is invalid. Coom brain. A thousand percent increase in erectile dysfunction in the last 15 years. Hmm. 
I wonder why that could be. What's changed? It's a real head scratcher, isn't it? The leftist porn addicts that are going to make pathetic response videos to this are going to be like, um, source, um, study, shut up, addict. You sacrifice the privilege of sympathy when you start rationalizing and trying to normalize your addiction throughout society so as to prevent yourself from realizing how weak you actually are. And that's the thing. They'll say, Pornography addiction isn't real unless you're watching it at work or in public, things like that, because they need to obfuscate symptoms of extreme, extreme addiction as just addiction in order to normalize their perversion throughout society. But to those who aren't coping, to those who don't think they're addicted or to those who just aren't sure, here's my challenge to you. Detox for 60 days. And if you're not addicted, shouldn't be a problem, right? And if you don't notice any significant improvements in your life, send me an email. Tell me I'm wrong. I'll send you a picture of myself eating my shorts, my pants. It's winter in Michigan. I'm not wearing shorts. Let's be realistic here. Seriously, why not quit? What do you have to lose? Worst case scenario, you just miss out on like, what, two months of doing something you like? I wish it were that simple. Unfortunately, it's not. What we're going to be talking about here is incredibly important. We're going to be very thorough, so please listen all the way through. We're going to go through the history and evolution of this problem, uh, the brain chemistry behind the addiction, the negative effects of that addiction on you as it pertains to your mental health, your sexual health, etc. And then we'll get into the negative effects that it has on society as it pertains to the family structure, women, etc. And then we'll debunk some of the most popular things claimed by the people who think that pornography is harmless or even healthy. We'll go over some of the ways that you can quit, and then we'll answer some of the most popular questions that you guys had from last time, because history suggests that we'll bounce back from the current trends in society. History suggests that, you know, eventually the hard times will create the strong men, right? Maybe, but the huge difference now is that everyone is pacified, everyone is totally numb. Like, how do you prevent hard times from breeding strong men? Sedate and distract them with pornography, drugs, mass media, consumerism, etc. And it's a huge problem. And if you end up resonating with what we talk about here, I implore you to share this video with every man in your life that you care about, regardless of their age, because it is incredibly important. So do stay tuned. It is imperative. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. It's officially the most wonderful time of the year. That time of year, the time of the year where I yell at the audience about porn. Love to see it. We knew it was coming. And the idea behind it, for those unfamiliar, is basically that there's this meme called No Nut November that we just got done with a couple months ago. A little late. And uh, the challenge is basically to go the entire month of November without masturbating, which means that a lot of guys see if they can make it a month without watching pornography. And then they almost invariably fail, dismiss it as a stupid internet challenge, and then go about their business. And so I'm here trying to kind of capitalize on some of that momentum, so to speak, along with the fact that it's the new year, people are thinking of resolutions, we're over a month into the resolutions, whatever. I'm trying to explain why you should stop watching pornography. I made one of these about a year ago, uh, but I intentionally didn't watch it before making this to avoid repeating myself as much as possible, because I want this video to be the best articulation of my position now, just like that video was the best articulation of my position then. That being said, I would highly recommend going back and watching the video from last year as well. I'll put a link to it in the description because tons of people found that video to be extraordinarily helpful and eye-opening. And that's actually, you know, what I kind of wanted to start out with. Like, firstly, my reasons for being against pornography have nothing to do with my religious beliefs. I was actually against pornography, believe it or not, before I really came into the faith. And I've learned that that's essentially the case with the vast majority of people who try to quit doing this stuff. The biggest online community that's related to this stuff, did a survey on this and found that only 20% of people said that part of the reason that they were doing this as far as like quitting it um, was for their religion. Like the vast majority of people who are trying to quit are just trying to quit because they're tired of being controlled and weighed down by it. And when I posted a video on this last year, I expected everyone to just get mad at me, but it turns out that almost everyone was on board with what we were saying. And I can't prove this, but I have it on good authority that we were the catalyst for the pornography debate that happened online about a year ago within the right, because we made a video and then coincidentally, some bigger conservatives made some videos, people started talking about it, all good stuff. It's an important conversation to have and we have to assert it into the mainstream dialogue because it's a cancer to our civilization. And I'll tell you that since I posted that video a year ago, I've received hundreds of messages, emails, letters from people literally all over the world. Fun fact, we actually have people watching this channel in literally almost every country in the world. There's only a handful that we're not reaching. 
That's your North Koreas, your Sudans, et cetera. I just think that's pretty cool. But yeah, I've gotten all of these responses from people. I've had people come up to me at events with tears in their eyes talking to me about how this issue has affected them. And there's a few reasons that I say this. Firstly, because it's indicative that we're heading in the right direction, that we've identified a serious problem and we're helping people solve it. That it's obviously very important despite the fact that it receives practically no attention. And secondly, so that if you're struggling with this, which frankly you probably are, you know that you're not alone and that there's no shame in this at all. A lot of times people on the right have this attitude of, well, you're on your own, bucko. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Your problems aren't my problems, snowflake. Sure, there's truth to that. Ultimately, you're responsible for yourself. But that aside, there's nothing conservative about not caring about people or not helping them. Conservatism properly defined is that which conserves the traditional American society. And that actually requires helping and caring about your neighbors, your family, your community, et cetera. So I will reiterate that there's no shame in pornography addiction, especially considering that what it is is quite literally a hijacking of your biological wiring as a man in order to neuroplastically rewire your brain into addiction, all for their profit and ultimately for the destruction of our society. The people running things have hijacked and exploited our biological drives to pursue food and sex to where we're now fat and addicted to pornography. And that's made us weak. They've made a lot of money doing that. And as we'll get into, the reasons that drugs such as methamphetamine and heroin are so powerfully addictive is that they hijack the precise mechanisms that are designed to regulate sex and the reward center of our brain. In other words, the reason that drugs are so addicting is because they hijack the mechanisms in your brain that are used to regulate sexual desire and co-opt them to compel you to crave more of that particular drug. So technically speaking, on a biological level, drugs are addictive because they exploit your sex drive, so to speak. So you can understand the cognitive implications of this, pornography, as something that will also exploit your sex drive more understandably because it exists as something that is an unnaturally exaggerated version of something that you are programmed to find irresistible. These are called supernormal stimuli which comes from renowned biologist Nicholas Timbergen, who was also a Nobel laureate. And then it is made available to you conveniently and in limitless supply, something that you would never find in nature. There is abundant novelty to what types you can access. And this all causes us to chronically overconsume and results in reconfigure our brains to try their best to adapt to this as we become addicted. Drugs are dangerous because they exploit the mechanisms in your brain that exist to regulate your sex drive. And this is incredibly addicting. And then the same thing happens when you have pornography in the way that we do now. It does practically the same thing to your brain. And we'll go through this step by step step, but this is why even heroin addicts will tell you that shooting up feels like an orgasm If when you talk to one, I don't know your circle. Um, and this is also why the brain scans of drug addicts are very similar to the brain scans of pornography users, but not addicts. That's what they'll say. But the truth is that there are basically two types of pornography users, those who will become addicted and those who already are addicted. And then within the latter category, you have those who know they're addicted and those who don't know or perhaps refuse to accept that they're addicted. And we'll you know, get into that, the neurochemistry behind that shortly to explain kind of what's going on in your brain. But I say this now to really just emphasize that there's no shame in pornography addiction because your brain is just simply not capable of handling that level of stimuli. Now, that being said, there is great shame in evangelically pretending that it doesn't exist. The so-called experts, the sex positive experts. These are people who say things like, um, this claim has been debunked. Um, this study says otherwise. And we'll address the most popular arguments from these people at the end. And by the way, I have anecdotes that can be corroborated thousands of times over online from people who have experienced this stuff. But I also have lots of data to back up what we're talking about here. But for now, what I'll say is this. I don't listen to degenerates. I just don't. And the reason for that is very simple. And it's that as human beings in the pursuit of virtue and truth, we can only reach the truth if we conquer and have total control over our desires. Otherwise, we will view everything through the lens of our desires since we do not have control over them, but rather they have control over us. And given that sexual desire is the most powerful desire that we have as human beings, I refuse to listen to degenerate people argue in favor of degenerate things. Because what is very likely happening is that they have a proclivity towards whatever aids in or alleviates the guilt from that desire, and that all ultimately distorts the truth. You wouldn't listen to a heroin addict talk about why heroin isn't actually a bad thing. You shouldn't listen to a porn addict argue the same. Their minds are corrupted by their desires and they are rationalizing it. And this is the part where the irrelevant streamer pauses the video and says, <laughs> Um, is John Doyle really comparing heroin addiction to pornography addiction? All the only couple thousand viewers watch me pretend to stare blankly at the screen before looking at the camera like Jim from The Office. No, I'm not actually comparing the effects of heroin to the effects of pornography because the effects of pornography have far worse implications on our society. We'll get into that. But even that in itself proves my point because there's this subculture of these really gross and vulgar leftists who exist online to let me live in their head rent free. They do these group therapy sessions where the fattest and the grossest one tries to bully me, which is impossible by the way, because you can't bully me. You just can't, I'm too epic. 
You're an addict. You're, you're literally an addict who's coping. And they're so corrupted by their desires that they simply can't imagine living without that occupying their consciousness because they're a slave. And so they'll say stuff because I'm a proponent of sexual morality. I detest hookup culture. And so they'll say, John Doyle's just mad because girls don't like him. He needs to get laid. And you look at these guys like, really? You and I go out to a bar or something, you think girls are going to be coming up to me like, oh my God, who's your friend over there? No, no, you're coping. Like, maybe, man to man, maybe you're picking up girls that are like high threes at best. You think you're winning somehow? Actually, I kind of feel bad for these guys because it's like, it's one thing if you're a good looking guy, you're charismatic, you decide to exploit that to go hook up with a bunch of attractive girls. I still think that's wrong, but like, I can understand that. Whereas these guys are hooking up with like these gross, overweight feminist types and it's like, it can't be because you think they're hot. So it's just because you are so addicted to lust that you are willing to resort to hooking up with girls that look like defective Pokemon to fulfill that desire. I just can't respect that. You have no self-control. That's why you're fat. That's why you hook up with gross women. You have group therapy sessions during which you and your other degenerate Generates all get together and try to bully me because it makes you feel less guilty about your behavior and lifestyle and it makes you feel less threatened by me and the boys. So don't care, didn't ask. Plus, you're an addict. You don't like me. You don't like my audience. You don't like America. You don't like Jesus because we're all epic and you're not and you're insecure about it. But it's okay. We're going to try to help you out too because at the end of the day, we still care about you. So let's jump into it. We have data, but keep in mind this problem is becoming so accelerated and widespread that we're not going to be able to wait a few decades to decide that it's terrible in the way that we did with cigarettes. We have to actually act quickly. And so, you know, one of the first things we mentioned was that 98% of men have accessed pornography within the last six months, 80% just within the last week. For reference, that means that statistically four out of the last five guys that you've spoken to are watching pornography at least once a week. That's where we're at now, roughly speaking. Let's talk about where we were. We used to be like a decade ago. We're focusing on guys younger than 30, by the way, since our brains have been the most harmed by this since they caught us when our brains were the most plastic. So in 2008, the percentage of boys who had been exposed to pornography before they were 13 was 14.4%. In 2011, it jumped to 48.7%. In 2017, there was a study done on people ages 15 to 29 that found that 69% of males had been exposed to pornography at age 13 or younger, and also that virtually all of the men by this point had viewed pornography at some point. So the average age at which boys are exposed to pornography is decreasing each year, but it's widely regarded to be 11 years old, which means that if we assume a normal distribution, 50% of boys are exposed to pornography when or before they are 11 years old. To help you realize how utterly insane and dangerous that is, here is a stock photo of an 11-year-old boy. Another thing to note is that of online pornography consumption done by minors, fully 22% of that is done by children younger than 10. That's almost a quarter of it. In 2008, the percentage of adolescents who viewed pornography every day was 5.2%. By 2011, it was over 13%. 2017, 39% of males between 15 and 29 viewed it daily. So the trend suggests that each year more people are watching it more often and at a younger age. And there is nothing to suggest that the trends are going to reverse or halt themselves. That's not good. And the problem that we have isn't exactly pornography in general. Like there was a time in this country when the best case scenario, especially for young men, was like the Sears catalog, maybe a Playboy that you paid way too much for and then buried in your closet. But we have to understand that what we're dealing with now is tremendously different than that. And it is something that we've never had in the history of the world, let alone the history of our society. And for the last decade or so, we have been witnessing the effects of it. And a lot of people might think that I'm just like out of touch or something. Don't get me wrong. Like if I had a son and my wife was like, I caught our son and his friends looking at a crumpled Polaroid photograph of a boob behind the garage. I would just laugh. I really wouldn't care. Women just tend to feel negatively about this type of stuff as a general rule. They're not exactly wrong in that. We'll come back to that later. But the point is that you had magazines, maybe pictures, still images, and then you had a finite amount, then maybe you had some X-rated movies, but you'd still have to go to adult bookstores to watch clips, those weird theaters that play them, not exactly a comfortable experience, then maybe, you know, you've got VHS tapes, then you actually have to go get VHS tapes, you have to buy it, it's a weird experience, you have to watch it, you can't just like skip around, you can only watch one at a time, unless you have multiple televisions with multiple VHS players, or the late night cable channels, but even then you actually have to watch the whole thing, you can't skip around, maybe you can like watch other channels, but still, as a general rule, you had to jump over hurdles to access pornography. And even then, it wasn't as good, per se, as what we're dealing with now. Then we had dial-up, which was cheaper, less expensive, you had more privacy, but it was still mostly just pictures. They would take forever to load. You couldn't just consume at a click, and if you wanted videos, you'd have to download stuff, but you know, maybe you don't have the right software. 
then you're risking getting a virus. It was still a relatively complicated process. Then 2006 happened, high-speed internet exploded, and everything got bad. That's when you started getting tube sites that had videos like YouTube, except it's pornography, and society basically teed itself up to collapse. And here we are, about 15 years later, dealing with the consequences of that. High-speed internet and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race, but yeah. Kind of a weird timeline to go through, I guess, but it's important to what we're about to get into with the addiction component, because it is because of this evolution that it has become so pervasive in our society so incredibly addictive. It's not clear to me at all that something like this could have ever happened with the Sears catalogs or the Playboys that we mentioned earlier, let alone to this degree of addiction, let alone to this degree of pervasiveness, and let alone to this degree of exposure to our children who really end up suffering the most in terms of how it damages their brain, but also in terms of how it damages their family and the society that they'll have to grow up in and live in for the rest of their lives. Like, it's one thing if you're a 50-year-old guy who discovers online pornography in 2009, but to be exposed to this as a child while your brain is developing, your entire generation is in the same boat, all the men in your life are watching it, even if they're not as negatively affected as you are, like no one wants to have this conversation. It's a big problem, and, and this isn't even taking into account the gateway to pornography for your children that is social media, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok especially. It's all terrible. If you're a parent, download the apps, look around for 10 minutes. You'll see exactly what I mean and also what your kid is looking at every day. But anyways, this is the part where we get into the nature of pornography addiction, so fasten your seatbelt. Some of this stuff is pretty dense, but we'll do our best, right? So first we have to summarize basically what pornography does to your brain in terms of addiction. We'll start at the very tip of the iceberg. So first, know that pornography does measurable damage to various parts of your prefrontal cortex. The good news is that this damage has been shown to be impermanent if the addiction is broken, but the bad news is that it makes it incredibly difficult to break and even acknowledge the reality of the addiction. For example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is associated with self-discipline, self-control, and compulsivity, will lose tissue and cause you to be more compulsive with your decision-making. The ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is associated with self-monitoring of behavior, will also lose tissue and cause you to have impaired self-monitoring, which basically means that you'll be less aware of what you're doing, which will make you less able to hold yourself accountable and behave properly. The medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with your awareness of your physical and emotional state, will also lose tissue and cause you to be more likely to be in a state of denial about your problem and to instead prioritize pursuing your addiction, and also your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with motivating you to pursue that which is beneficial to you, will be damaged as well and cause you to be instead motivated to pursue your addiction. So that's very important to note. And moving on, we get into the fact that basically you're classified as a mammal. And technically speaking, rats are also mammals. But since we're on team human, we don't want to do potentially unethical testing on ourselves. So instead we do a lot of testing on rats because they spawn quickly. They're inexpensive. They're easy to house. Most importantly though, they're very closely related to us in terms of biological and genetic makeup. And for that reason, you can replicate a lot of symptoms of the human condition in rats. And there's something observed in rats, but also in many other mammals that has been called the Coolidge effect. And it is an example of how continuous sexual novelty can drive the behavior of mammals. So if you take a male rat, put him in a cage with a female rat, he's going to assert himself because rats don't have a Me Too movement. And he will continue to assert himself until he gets bored. And even you know, if the female rat is like, what are we? He, he'll just be done. He'll be totally bored with her, doesn't want anything to do with her. But then if you throw in a different female rat, he will reassert himself with her until he gets bored again. You can literally repeat this process with new female rats until the male rat collapses from exhaustion. This is because his top genetic priority is reproduction, and new female rats allow him to do that. Now, of course, human beings are a bit more sophisticated than rats. We actually have a Me Too movement. Our mating process is more complex. And we're part of the about 5% of mammals with the capacity for long-term bonds. But our brains are still affected by the Coolidge effect, which gets its name from President Calvin Coolidge, based. And the story goes, that he was touring a farm with his wife and the farmer showed his wife a rooster that spent all day every day mating with hens and his wife supposedly said tell that to Mr. Coolidge and so the farmer did and then Coolidge responded by asking if it was with the same hen the farmer said no and he replied tell that to Mrs. Coolidge pretty epic joke women take the L yet again but anyways the takeaway is that continuous sexual novelty tends to drive the behavior of mammals with the idea being that your best case scenario for continuing the bloodline is if every female is pregnant now young man this desire that you have to get every female pregnant arises largely from a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine amps up the centerpiece of a very primitive part of your brain known as the reward circuitry, which is where you get your cravings and your pleasure, but also your addictions. This part of your brain is what makes you want to do the things that keep you alive and get women pregnant, basically. <laughs> as a human, your list of priorities are like food, sex, love, friendship, novelty. These are called natural rewards, and they are different from addictive chemicals. 
But the problem is that addictive chemicals can hijack the same circuitry in your brain as we talked about earlier. So the whole reason that you have dopamine is to motivate you to do whatever serves those interests, basically. Lots of dopamine when you eat candy, not a whole lot when you eat cauliflower. That's just the way it works. It tells you where to direct your attention and what to pursue. And it also helps you remember those things by rewiring your brain via new or stronger nerve connections. And sexual stimulation and orgasm add up to the biggest natural release of dopamine and opioids available to your reward circuitry. So you can start to see why we need to be careful. Because a lot of people describe dopamine as the pleasure chemical. That's not actually accurate because it's much more about seeking and searching for that pleasure, not the pleasure in itself. As you get closer, your dopamine rises with anticipation and it motivates you to keep going towards whatever you want, whether that's immediate pleasure or a long-term goal. And it does this by attaching to receptors in your brain to stimulate electrical impulses. What you end up feeling is the actual pleasure is the release of the opioids, um, which also bind to the receptors in the reward circuitry of your brain. So dopamine compels you to find water and then opioids are the relief feeling that you get upon quenching your thirst. Dopamine is what makes you want to get the female pregnant. Opioids are the feeling that you get upon doing so. You get the point. Dopamine makes you want stuff. Opioids make you like stuff. But the problem with that is that they aren't so easily separated in our brains. So dopamine causes us to desire and seek things, but dopamine is also a stronger system than our opioid system, which means that we're always seeking more than we are satisfied. And the reason for that is that seeking and desiring is more likely to keep us alive than just sitting around satiated, satisfied, in a daze doing nothing. But the problem is that this imbalance, when overstimulated, leads ultimately to addiction because the desires and the cravings increase while the pleasure you get decreases. So you want something more and more, but you don't like it as much as you used to, so you compensate by craving more of it, and the cycle continues. Another thing that we mentioned earlier that plays a big role here is novelty. That's the Coolidge effect. Dopamine surges for novelty. Without novelty, it diminishes over time. They've done studies where they'll show a group of men part of an X-rated movie and measure their dopamine, and it gets lower every time they play it back, and then they play part of a different one, and it shoots right back up. And it's also true that men will ejaculate faster in greater volume and with faster sperm when viewing a new naked girl pretty as opposed to the same one. So basically your brain can't tell the difference between watching pornography and having sex. And so in the span of a shameful afternoon with a few extra tabs open, you can have more sexual partners according to your brain than your ancestors would have had in their entire lives. And if you think your brain has the hardware to handle this, you are mistaken. This gets back into the supernormal stimuli that we touched on earlier because it's not just the endless novelty that makes this so bad, but also the adjacent emotions and stimuli as well, since dopamine also fires up for things like surprise or shock factor, violations of your expectations, you never thought you'd see something like this, anxiety, maybe this goes against your values or even your sexuality, also generally searching and seeking things out. All of those things, of course, are rampant in pornography, and many of them not only elevate dopamine, like anxiety, shock, surprise, shame, etc., but they also boost your stress hormones and neurotransmitters, and that ends up increasing your excitement and amplifying the effects of the dopamine. And over time, I kid you not, your brain can start to confuse feelings of anxiety or riskiness with feelings of sexual arousal. And this explains why pornography addicts often escalate into watching more extreme and more shocking content, because they need that extra neurochemical boost. It also explains why if you've ever felt suddenly stressed out by something, and your first instinct is to watch pornography, you're like, what the hell? It's because you built that association in your brain. The common phrase is neurons that fire together wire together. And if you amplify the effects of the dopamine with these neurochemicals, then what's going to happen is that. And then when something totally random happens to you that stresses you out, has nothing to do with that, you'll feel compelled to watch pornography because you've rewired your brain, literally. Your brain will have confused anxiety or riskiness for sexual arousal. Speaking of stress, there's this myth that pornography is good because it relieves stress. First of all, you have to laugh at the utter state of the coom brain. Like, yeah, dude, that's why you're watching porn 10 times a week. You're just stressed out. It's like, no, go for a run, take a bath, do something else. Like, at least be honest with yourself that watching pornography to relieve stress is just you trying to justify your addiction. And that aside, it doesn't actually relieve stress because as we'll get into, it literally rewires your brain to make you more miserable. So even if you can achieve that temporary relief, it will soon go away and your baseline levels of stress and general despair are going to be much higher if you're using pornography. And I have to stress this point again, which is that given the incredibly addictive nature of pornography and how widespread that addiction is in our society, it's not only possible, but probable that anyone arguing its benefits is only trying to justify their addiction. It really is that simple. I would never listen to a cigarette addict tell me that cigarettes are good, or at the very least not bad, the same way that I would never listen to a pornography addict tell me that their addiction is the same. Like they're judgment is clouded by the addiction. Their prefrontal cortex has been damaged and compromised. We just went over the details of that. But back to the supernormal stimulus. The concept we discussed earlier, basically the danger lies when you have something that is registered in our brains as especially valuable to us, something that is an artificially exaggerated version of something that our brains are wired to find irresistible, and then that is available conveniently in limitless supply, which could never be found in nature, and it comes in limitless varieties. That's the novelty we talked about earlier. And as a result of these things, we're chronically overconsuming it. 
There are two components in our society that first come to mind when talking about this. Uh, first one is junk food and then pornography. Junk food is already recognized to be a super normal stimulus. Uh, you know, we're all fat and gross as a result of it. And there's an argument to be made that the government subsidizes junk food so that we're all too fat and lazy to do something about it. I, of course, I would never make that argument the same way that I would never make the argument that the government enables widespread pornography access in order to keep us depressed, pacified, and distracted because I know that the government always has my best interest at heart. I live in Michigan. Are you kidding me? The point is that pornography is actually more potent supernormal stimulus than junk food is simply because of its nature, namely the fact that it costs less, can be accessed with a few clicks at any time from practically anywhere. There's no precise physical limits on its consumption, whereas you have to eventually stop eating because your stomach has a capacity. You can just keep watching pornography until you like pass out or something. This is where we get back into the parallels to drug addiction and also the rats, because we actually have research that shows that methamphetamine and cocaine hijack the same reward center nerve cells that evolved for sexual conditioning. And some of these studies have shown that sex to completion shrinks the cells that pump dopamine through the reward circuit, and also that those dopamine producing nerve cells shrink with heroin addiction. So what does that mean? Well, the reason that drugs like methamphetamine and heroin are compelling is that they hijack the precise mechanisms in our brain that are designed for sex. So while it's true that there are other pleasures that activate the reward center of our brain, the fact is that the nerve cells don't overlap nearly as closely as they do with sex, which is why non-sexual natural rewards feel different and less compelling. So sex is the most compelling given the hardware of our brain and drugs are incredibly compelling because they hijack that hardware and overload it basically. And so sexual arousal and orgasm induce higher levels of dopamine and opioids than any other natural reward, but there are other components below our conscious awareness that play a role as well. For example, uh, there's a protein that accumulates through sex and drug use called delta Fos B, and it activates genes involved with addiction, and the molecular changes that it generates are nearly identical for both sexual conditioning and chronic use of drugs. So regardless of what you're abusing, high levels of delta Fos B accumulate and rewire the brain to pursue more of that thing, which is how addictive drugs co-opt the learning mechanisms um, in our brain that are designed to make us pursue sexual activity. And by the way, this is related to why if you look at brain scans of drug addicts compared to brain scans of pornography users, but not addicts, they're practically identical. But anyways, the climax of that sexual activity causes lots of temporary neurological and hormonal changes to occur, upon which I don't really care to elaborate since the political implications from the neurochemistry of the orgasm, heck off commie, is something that I was really looking forward to covering at a later time. That's the highbrow content that the people want. But we do know that these changes do not occur with any other natural rewards, and we know that this is done by our brains so that we know the difference between sexual activity and drinking a milkshake. But we also know that dopamine plays a very significant role in this. And we'll actually just debunk this right now because there's this common argument about pornography addiction and dopamine, and it's literally, well, lots of different things raise your dopamine levels, so there's no difference between watching pornography and watching a sunset. And we actually tested that theory about 20 years ago, and it turns out that it's total BS. Uh, we did a study with brain scans and it found that cocaine addicts had nearly identical brain patterns when viewing images of pornography and images of crack pipes and also that everyone had the same brain activation patterns for viewing pornography so connect the dots there and finally that the patterns were completely different for looking at sunsets the point being that drugs and sex can activate the sex neurons in your brain without actual sex and sunsets can't you idiot it is obvious that our most powerful natural reinforcer is orgasm which means that there is no neurological equivalent to streaming and masturbating to pornography you can do drugs you can drink drink, you can play video games, you can do whatever you want to elevate your dopamine, but none of that will have the power to sculpt your sexual brain circuitry the way that pornography does, especially if you're watching it at a young age when your brain is the most plastic and susceptible to that. And this is where it starts to get kind of dangerous because you have to take into account the binge mechanism that is programmed into your brain for what your brain perceives will help your survival, things like food and sex. And whenever you binge things like food and sex, your brain thinks that you've hit the jackpot and it neurochemically reacts to incentivize you to keep going. Like it literally overrides any instinct to stop because you're full or because you've had enough. So this being the case, you can understand the problem that we've created in the last 15 years where your brain thinks that internet pornography has provided to it conceivably endless made opportunities, so to speak. As long as you have an internet connection, you can go forever and you'll never consume all the available content. And your brain was not designed, nor is it prepared to handle that kind of nonstop stimulation. So what does it do? What does the brain, particularly the young male brain, do when it has unlimited access to a super stimulating reward that it never evolved to handle? It tends to adapt, but not in a good way. 
Remember what we just talked about with the substance or chemical addictions, how it restructures the brain, works the same way with behavioral addictions. We just covered how sexual arousal and addictive drugs like meth and cocaine stimulate the same group of reward system nerve cells while triggering the same mechanisms in your brain that make you crave more. And so given that, it's not surprising that sexual conditioning through pornography and drug use involve the same general brain changes, which are changes involving sensitization. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Basically, the neurochemical events that create sensitization are caused by spikes of dopamine, but the actual thing in your brain that produces it is our friend from earlier, that protein uh, delta Phos B. And essentially what happens is that dopamine surges trigger the production of delta Phos B, and it then slowly accumulates in the reward circuitry of your brain in proportion to the amount of dopamine that you release when you chronically indulge in your natural reward of choice, sex, junk food, those drugs that we mentioned earlier, whatever. And the protein delta Phos B is referred to as a transcription factor because it activates a very specific set of genes to physically and chemically alter the reward circuitry of your brain in order to chase that dopamine. It essentially reacts to the behavior that triggers the dopamine release in order to program your brain to remember and then want to repeat those behaviors. And so with things like pornography, given the way that it exists, you know, that we talked about earlier, your brain ends up being literally rewired to exponentially crave whatever you've been binging on. So that's where you get into a spiral where you want something, you do it, you secrete lots of dopamine, causes delta Phos B to accumulate, that makes the initial urge even stronger, then it rinses and repeats and it gets stronger every time. This is based on the phrase that we mentioned earlier, um, neurons that fire together, wire together, because your brain will strengthen the connection of those cells with repeated activation. And when you link together the nerve cells for sexual excitement with the nerve cells for storing the information associated with that, which would be what you're watching, where you're watching it, how you're watching it, et cetera, it further cements the whole process in your brain because now you'll have totally normal things in your life serving as triggers, which I know is something that we laugh at whenever the left says it, but it's a real thing. So if your parents leave and you suddenly have an urge to watch pornography, if you're on your phone, you suddenly had that urge, whatever it may be in your case, that's why your brain has strengthened the association between your sexual excitement and the things that exist independently of and adjacent to that excitement, which makes it so that when you notice those things, or maybe even when you don't notice them, it triggers sexual excitement regardless because you have rewired your brain. Literally the same way that heroin addicts can be triggered by the sight of needles, alcoholics can be triggered by the smell of alcohol. It's the same brain mechanisms. And these brain changes tend to keep us over consuming because your brain wasn't designed designed to handle this level of stimuli. And so it thinks it's just temporarily binging. It just, it doesn't have the capacity to sustainably handle the infinite supply of these supernormal stimuli. And this leads to both addiction and sexual conditioning. So with this, there's good and bad news. The good news is that when you break your addiction, your levels of Delta Phos B will drop to normal levels after about two months. But the bad news is that the neurological pathways that have been sensitized will remain as such for much longer and possibly even for your whole life, which means that eventually, yeah, the cravings won't be as strong, but if you give into them again, you'll be back to square one pretty quickly. And I know this might be boring or confusing, but this in itself completely destroys the idea that pornography addiction does not exist. The fact that Delta Phos B accumulates in the reward center of the brain is now considered to be a sustained molecular switch for both behavioral and chemical addictions. And anyone who tells you otherwise is coping because they're slaves to their carnal desires. Now here's where it starts to get bad because once you're stuck in that cycle where you're craving it and then the more you indulge in it, the more you crave it, et cetera, your brain actually has a mechanism to try to get you to chill out. And it's a molecule called CREB, we'll call it CREB. And it dampens your pleasure response basically by inhibiting dopamine. And it's your brain's way of trying to make you chill out on whatever you're binging on, make it less enjoyable so you just kind of relax for a second. And this molecule is actually produced alongside Delta Phos B when you secrete high levels of dopamine. And this is done because at the end of the day, your body's just trying to help you out a little bit, trying to keep you under control, trying to tell you a couple thousand years ago that it's time to leave the blueberry bush, go check on the kids, whatever it may be. But that was long before the utter catastrophe of high-speed internet. So now you have these incredibly powerful reinforcers that override those satiation mechanisms in your brain due to the manner in which they exist. The blueberry Bush is much different than an evening spent on Pornhub while drinking Baja Blast and smoking marijuana, basically. And this results in desensitization, or in other words, tolerance, which as we know just means that you need more of something to achieve the same effect. And as we also know, this is a key feature of addiction. And with pornography, that might mean watching more of it, watching more extreme versions of it, whatever it may be. And we've already talked about how that type of increased stimulation will elevate your dopamine and confuse you emotionally, etc. But here's a huge takeaway, probably even the biggest takeaway for the average viewer, and that is the fact that the effect 
effects of Kreb are not limited to just pornography because it doesn't exist just for pornography. It exists to dull the effects of pleasure. And as a result of this, you will start to notice that things in your life that you used to enjoy, like hanging out with your friends, watching movies, playing video games, whatever, you'll notice that they aren't as enjoyable to you anymore. They seem less interesting or even dull. That's because of Kreb. It leaves you bored and less satisfied with your normal life and its activities, which leaves you searching for and prioritizing whatever can elevate your dopamine just so you can feel something again, which for many of us means watching pornography. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, now, wait a minute. How can watching pornography increase and decrease my dopamine levels at the same time? Good question. It all comes down to the sequence of events. That's uh, the increase of dopamine activity with sensitization and delta phos B, and then there's a decrease of dopamine activity with desensitization and CREB. And so for this to make sense, you kind of have to understand, you know, the difference in how your brain regards what you want versus what it likes. So basically, when you're triggered by something to be sexually aroused, the sensitization will cause your dopamine to be spiked. You'll have really strong cravings before you actually start indulging them. Remember that dopamine is the searching for pleasure chemical, not simply just the pleasure chemical. And then once you indulge those cravings, less dopamine um, and less opioids are secreted, uh, which is the desensitization, which makes it less pleasurable to you than before, which increases your cravings for more, et cetera. So it's a dangerous cycle to get into because it simultaneously drives your compulsive use while decreasing the fulfillment that you get from that use, along with from everyday activities in general, which will make you numb and miserable over time. And this can be corroborated by brain scans that show that pornography addicts have greater activation in their reward systems during the craving phase, but also that they don't actually enjoy pornography more than people who aren't addicted to it. So now, given what we know about how the brain is affected, do you understand how terrible this is, especially for young people, people whose brains are still the most plastic, whose brains are still developing? We are the guinea pigs. We are experiencing a sexual conditioning that our parents could not have even begun to emulate with their Playboys and VHS tapes. Our entire frame of reference for sexuality has been established for us in the form of mass-produced, mass-marketed super stimuli that exist to addict you for the profit of a select few. It's warping our sexual desires. It's warping our sexual practices preferences. It's literally making us depressed, as we've discussed. It's making us less attracted to real women. It gives us erectile dysfunction, and it's only going to get worse. There is no trend that would suggest that it gets better because nobody's talking about this. No one wants to take action because everyone's addicted to it. Even back in 2004, as early as 2004, almost 20 years ago, there was a study done by Swedish researchers that found that 99% of young men had consumed pornography and that more than half of them felt that it had an impact on their sexual behavior. Fast forward to 2016, we have data that shows that 49% of men report viewing pornography that was not previously interesting to them or that they once even considered to be, quote, disgusting. What's more is that fully 20% of them admitted to using pornography to, quote, maintain arousal with my partner. You see the problem there? You understand what's wrong with that? Using the artificial to which you have warped and grounded your desires in order to successfully partake in the natural and the real. Think about this for a second, and please don't answer aloud. And again, there's no shame in this because everyone is a victim of this in some capacity. But just think to yourself about the most repulsive thing that you've ever gotten off to. I know you know what it is, and I know that you know that it's wrong in a clear mind. Now think about how tragic it is that there are people making money off getting 11-year-old boys to watch the same type of stuff, or even more repulsive stuff. Think about whether you've ever had to use pornography to sustain yourself while having sex with your partner. Do you understand the problem with that? Do you understand why that's wrong? And, you know, we'll talk more about this when we get into the societal effects of this stuff, but I want you to just be thinking about that as we go along because recognizing the degree to which this problem exists or has manifested in your life is keystone to solving it and liberating yourself from it. And with young people, I want to get back to what we talked about earlier with neurons that fire together, wire together, and the association between sexual arousal and the other adjacent factors because one of the most important things that happens to us as we go through puberty um, and our brains are still developing until we're like 24, 25, is that we both consciously and unconsciously learn about sex. And part of how this is accomplished is by your brain wiring to respond to sexual cues in your environments. And adolescents wire together these experiences with arousal much faster and much more easily than young adults do despite an age difference of only a few years. And teenagers are especially vulnerable because their entire reward circuitry is basically just an overdrive the whole time. And as a result of that, they experience an exaggerated version of the cycle that we discussed earlier, which means that they experience higher spikes of dopamine, but also they become bored more easily. And this is because they are more sensitive to dopamine and they also produce more delta phos B. So because the adolescent brain is overly sensitive to reward, it is much more vulnerable to addiction. And the scary thing about that is that your brain as an adolescent neurochemically urges you to define sex by whatever offers the biggest buzz, so to speak, which 
which is why the effects of pornography are not the same on adolescents and adults. And this is confirmed by brain scans from a Cambridge study in 2014, because basically your brain naturally sculpts itself to narrow a teen's choices by the time they reach adulthood. And this is because the nerve connections in your brain are governed by a fairly straightforward policy of like use it or lose it, which allows your responses to life to be well honed theoretically. And this is why after you reach about 12, um, your brain actually like shrinks because billions of nerve connections are pruned and reorganized. But the point is that as a teenager, you can literally condition pornography to be your entire sexual frame of reference. You can do this so easily and you've probably already done it to a certain extent such that real sex with a real woman can actually feel like a weird experience to you or it's less interesting to you because it's deviant from your sexual frame of reference. And this damage is not easy to undo, my friends. I am begging you with tears in my eyes to quit watching this now. Your most powerful and lasting memories and habits all arise during adolescence. And while you can liberate yourself from some of this artificial sexual conditioning that we've unfortunately all probably had to experience, it can still be a deep scar in your brain. And the longer you're subject to this conditioning, the worse it's gonna be. Break the conditioning, Western man. Your ancestors did great things back when it was harder to see boobs. That's like, it's literally not a coincidence. <laughs> like, we know that your sexuality can be conditioned and we know that it is even more likely to happen during adolescence. We talked about this earlier, how these associations are formed in your brain with things that aren't even explicitly sexual. And we've confirmed this empirically by doing studies where men view pornography at the same time they view something like a boot or a jar of pennies. And after a while, they become aroused by simply viewing the boot or the pennies without the pornography even present because they formed that association in their brains because they have been conditioned. This type of conditioning can affect all sorts of things, um, including certain visuals, certain objects, scents, even things like animal costumes or sexual partners of the same sex. That's a red pill that most people aren't ready for. There's a strong argument to be made that taking into account what we've gone over throughout this video, you can understand the path of a prematurely and overly sexualized young man watching more extreme types of pornography, things that make them anxious, things that they know are wrong because those feelings elevate them. They help them to chase that, that elevated dopamine and eventually conditioning himself literally to be a furry or to be sexually attracted to men. Sure, a lot of it comes down to prenatal hormone exposure in terms of what is ultimately predictive of its manifestation, but the bottom line is that science has never found a gay gene and it's certainly never going to find a furry gene. Do with that as you will. We found out through other brain scan studies that not only can these associations be formed with completely random things like squares or pictures of trees, but also that pornography addicts form these associations in their brains faster and more intensely than those who are not addicted to pornography. But the good news is that as it pertains to this type of conditioning, your brain will return to normal after a few months free from whatever you've conditioned it to be aroused to. It will evolve, but backwards. And then once you're in that normal state of mind again, you'll realize how weird those things were and the magnitude of the conditioning that you'd undergone. And what's a very important, but perhaps not so so obvious consequence of that conditioning. Your PP literally stops working. You as a man have sacrificed the functionality of your PP at the altar of screen whores. Your ancestors aren't mad, they're just disappointed. But before we talk about why this happens, another personal question that I implore you not to answer aloud. Do you still get morning wood, bro? Remember you'd wake up, you have to go pee, and you have to like lean over the toilet until your torso is parallel with your pee-pee. It was a challenge, but it built character, damn it. But the point is that a lot of guys don't even have that anymore, and they haven't really noticed it or given it too much thought, but that's a problem. Another problem, we talked about this earlier, symptom of this, uh, being unable to sustain yourself or even get it up, so to speak, when engaging with real women. And I apologize if this is vulgar, but like, come on, man, we're literally talking about pornography here. So to expect TVY7 caliber dialogue would just be unrealistic. But this too is part of erectile dysfunction caused by pornography. And before we get into the data, simply understand that it is not normal for young men to be in these positions and not be good to go. But anyways, there's a couple dozen studies linking sexual dysfunction to pornography use because of everything that we talked about earlier. And this is the part where the pornography addicts chime in like, um, causation does not equal correlation. And it's like, wow, dude, I also have taken statistics 101. Sick, bro. I almost, I almost wish I'd gone to college so that I could write incredibly pretentious academic papers on concepts that I noticed that are just basically posts. Like this one in particular, I see it everywhere. And once you see it, you can never unsee it. I like to refer to it as the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence. And it's basically that in terms of practical intelligence, there is greater unity between those with above average intelligence and below average intelligence than there is between people um, with average intelligence and either of the aforementioned groups. So the both, both ends of the bell curve kind of come together like a horseshoe. 
And what I think this really comes down to is that people with average intelligence, people who are mediocre, uh, they're still smart enough to realize that they're smarter than some people. And so they cope with their feelings of mediocrity by asserting themselves over those people in ways that are just often incorrect. I'll give you an example. Defund the police. Go ask any stupid person. And I don't mean someone who you disagree with politically. I mean like a legitimately unintelligent person. Ask them what they think about defunding the police. And they will tell you. Now wait just a minute. That's about the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Who's going to catch the criminals, etc. I can only make fun of white people or else I'll get banned. And, you know, if you ask someone with average intelligence, someone who's unexceptional, someone who's probably college educated, go ask them. That's when you're going to get the answer. The IQ of 104. Hey, what do you think about the police? Those are the people who will tell you, well, crime is caused by circumstance. We need social workers to handle these cases, etc. Whereas if you told an unintelligent person that social workers could prevent these things, they would just laugh at you. Because while they may be unintelligent, they've actually retained more common sense than those with average intelligence because they actually need it to survive and get by in the world. Whereas people with average intelligence don't necessarily need that common sense because they have greater access to opportunity. And of course, if you ask someone with above average intelligence about defunding the police, they'll just laugh at you as well. It's like the sleep woke bespoke meme. And it's the same with this. You got the low IQ people who will say, well, gosh, dang it. I don't want my son watching that internet pornograph. He's going to rot his mind. <laughs> you got the average IQ people like, Actually, studies that have corroborated that have only found associations, and causation does not equal correlation. I am so smart! And then the high IQ people are like, hey, we're not talking about random variables. Like, for example, the fact that there's almost a perfect correlation between U.S. crude oil imports and the domestic per capita consumption of chicken. We're not talking about that. We're actually talking about what we know about neurobiology and neuropsychology, and we're applying that appropriately and saying, hey, given what we know about this, we predict that with this new epidemic of pornography consumption, this is what's probably going to happen. These are the effects that will manifest. And then, oh, wait a minute. Exactly what would logically be expected to happen has happened, and it's reflected in our research. But then the 104 IQ people are like... No, but I must be smart. Causation does not equal correlation. Those are my least favorite types of people. Everyone thinks I'm a eugenicist. I want to get rid of the lower people. I just want to get rid of the people in the middle. They're annoying. Low IQ nationalism, I'm here for it. But that aside, it's also basically impossible to do experiments on this, the effects of this type of stuff because you can't find a control group of men who haven't been exposed to it anymore. We'll get more into that in a second. But essentially what happens is that because of your sexual conditioning, you have certain expectations wired into your brain. And dopamine will elevate when something is better than you expected, but it'll also drop when something isn't as good as you expected. And once you've conditioned yourself to internet pornography, real sex is never going to be able to meet that expectation because it can't compete with all of the variables that classify it as a supernormal stimulus. And resultantly, your unconscious expectations probably won't be met and your dopamine will drop, which means your pee pee will drop because you need consistent dopamine to maintain sexual arousal and a functioning pee pee. When it comes to PP functionality, I trust the science. And the science says that you need adequate dopamine in your reward circuitry and in the sexual centers of your brain. And obviously, there are different types of erectile dysfunction. Sometimes it's caused by things like blood vessels or nerve problems. But we're talking about psychological causes. And if you look at scans of gray matter in the brain's reward center, in the brain's sexual centers, in the hypothalamus, you'll find that lost gray matter equates with loss of nerve cell branches and connections with other nerve cells, which means that it's not just performance anxiety, but it can also be a literal consequence of changes to the reward circuitry of your brain, which have resulted in persistently reduced dopamine signaling, which explains why your morning wood is gone and why it's going to take months to come back once you start to break this conditioning. And this matches the results of another brain scan study conducted in Germany um, and published in JAMA Psychiatry. The results are less gray matter and general desensitization, which is what we talked about earlier. And you can measure things like gray matter and desensitization in a brain scan. But the nucleus of your sexual conditioning, so to speak, the real magnitude of it can't be articulated on paper by some lab coat. That's something that will ultimately be dependent on your level of honesty and self-understanding. But to get back into the addiction components of it, because anybody who hears this can just dismiss it by saying, well, as long as it's not addictive, who cares? You you can just stop anytime you want. We've already talked about those types of people and classified them properly as people who are basically coping by rationalizing their sexual degeneracy. We've also talked about the characteristics of this addiction, specifically that just like substance addiction, it elevates your dopamine significantly, which is why the same nerve cells are active as when cocaine and methamphetamine are used, and that this is different from all other natural rewards. And even though addictions are not all the same, we still know that they all essentially cause the same core changes to your brain, which can be summarized basically as 
a craving and preoccupation with doing whatever it is that you're addicted to, a loss of control with how much you're doing it and the ways in which you're doing it, and also the negative um, consequences of you doing it, whether those are financial, physical, mental, social, doesn't matter. So what's interesting about this is that we know that the substances that follow this pattern can and do create addictions, but they're much more infrequent than you would think. It only causes about 10 to 15% of human and animal test subjects to become addicted um, when trials are conducted. But we have to be very careful with the conclusions that we're drawing from this. Because it's not that we're safe from addiction, but rather that we're relatively safe from those specific addictions. But in terms of natural rewards, things like those supernormal stimuli that we discussed earlier, things like junk food, you're not safe at all. Why is this? Why is it that even if you're not susceptible to addiction, why is it that you can still get extremely addicted to supernormal stimuli in the forms of junk food and pornography? I don't know. Maybe because your brain is designed to pursue food and sex. Maybe that's why. Food and sex are S tier, drugs and alcohol are lower. How many people are addicted to drugs and alcohol? I don't know, but I do know that 70% of American adults are overweight and fully 37% of them are obese. That's going to cause a lot more deaths than drugs are. Libertarians are like, yeah, he wants a small government to legalize all drugs. Nice try. I actually want a big government to usher in state-enforced physical fitness. That's a joke. Kind of. The point is that we know what that supernormal stimulus is doing to American society. Now, what if you had one that was available in even greater quantity, novelty, and it was totally free? Not good, folks. Not good. And it's difficult to find data on this because it tends to be something done in private. But we've got data from 2014 that found that 33% of men between the ages of 18 and 30 either thought they were addicted or were unsure, which is significantly more than the just 5% of men between the ages of 15 and 68 who felt the same. Then we've got two studies from 2016, both found that it was about 28%. Now, even ignoring what we know about the upward trends in terms of how many people are addicted, the age at which they're getting addicted, and even ignoring how catastrophic it would be for society if even just 28 or 33% of the men were addicted to pornography, which we'll elaborate upon later. I'm going to just go ahead and assert that about 85% of men in this country are addicted to porn. 85%, that's the figure. What's my source? My feelings? I just, I feel that this is true. And if you've consumed pornography in the last 365 days, you're not allowed to dispute this because your consciousness is corrupted by desire and addiction. You simply can't see the same things that I can see. Your third eye is, is calcified by the smut and tarnish of lust. It is at least 85%. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt you. All jokes aside, uh, one of the first figures that we went over was 80% of men watching pornography at least once a week. Given what we've been talking about, I find it very hard to believe that they're not addicted. And then I myself threw in an extra 5% for good measure. There we have it, 85% at least. And remember, anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt you. Now, that being said, a lot of people, even in the medical and scientific fields, think that, uh, well, we can't use what we know about addiction to understand compulsive behaviors like gambling and pornography use, and there's just no such thing as a behavioral addiction. That's what they say. Only substance addictions, like with heroin and the other drugs that we mentioned earlier. And this is often promoted by the media, um, but the most updated research that we have actually contradicts this idea. For example, if you look in the DSM-5, addiction is one of the only mental disorders that can be reproduced at will in a laboratory setting. In other words, we know exactly how to make animals and people addicted to something, and we can do it whenever we we want to. Wouldn't it be a shame if oligarchs use this knowledge to harm and profit off our society? Okay, relax, relax. The point is that we can study what happens to the brain in these settings, even down to the molecular level. And what we find with thousands of brain studies, whether it's addiction to methamphetamine, heroin, whatever, is that all addictions modify the same fundamental brain mechanisms and produce a recognized set of anatomical and chemical alterations. There is no doubt amongst addiction experts that behavioral and chemical addictions are fundamentally the same. We've got like 230 brain studies on internet addicts that reveal the same changes that we've been talking about in substance addicts. So if we know that the internet is addictive, it's evident that contemporary pornography is as well. And sure enough, this is confirmed by the brain studies on people who watch pornography. There was a landmark review done recently which outlined the four fundamental brain changes caused by addiction. They might ring a bell. And they are sensitization, desensitization, dysfunctional prefrontal circuitry, and a malfunctioning stress system. And studies on contemporary pornography users find evidence of each of these. Start with the first ones sensitization. That can be defined as an unconscious super memory of pleasure, which when activated triggers powerful cravings. Your parents leave, all of a sudden you feel compelled to watch pornography. Uh, you're stressed out, same thing happens. You see a model on Instagram, that's what that is. And there's about 20 studies reporting sensitization and cue reactivity in pornography users. And even when you try to quit or you don't use it for a while, those sensitized pathways are still there and they grow even stronger for a while. Your reward system is literally begging you to stimulate it. And with that sensitization amplified, your brain's reward center uses the same mechanisms involved in normal learning and memory. And it might get weaker once you quit after a while, but they're going to remain there for a very long time, depending on how intense your addiction was. That's why so many anti-addiction organizations advocate complete abstinence from whatever you're addicted to, because anything else 
will sustain those developed pathways, which won't allow you to get better. And then we get into the second one, which is desensitization, which is basically a numbed response to that pleasure. This is typically the first addiction-related brain change that addicts notice. Basically, the reduced dopamine and opioid signaling uh, leaves you less sensitive to everyday pleasures and starving for things that will raise those levels again. And this is the cycle of tolerance with which we're all familiar. You need more of something to achieve the previous effect, and it keeps getting worse and worse. And we talked earlier about how your brain will release Kreb to inhibit dopamine in your reward circuit which will then decrease as you abstain from your vice. But this itself doesn't really explain why people still feel numb and depressed even months after quitting their vice. And that's because the more lasting causes would be things like lost gray matter, declining dopamine and opioid receptors, which literally means that instead of your brain just protecting itself from excessive um, stimulation with Kreb, it's also going to remove some of your receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. It literally removes your D2 receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. And D2 receptors just so happen to help control cravings. So without them, your cravings are going to be that much harder to control. On the bright side, your brain can rebuild these receptors over time, but you know, you're going to have to quit frying your reward circuitry first. And it's this imbalance that is the biggest driver of addiction. You're dealing with incredibly powerful cravings that keep increasing in intensity and then experiencing less pleasure in everyday life because of desensitization, which makes you gravitate towards the things that give you the most dopamine because you just want to feel something, basically. Remember, fellas, you're not horny, you're just depressed. And there have been at least six studies confirming these neurological effects in pornography users. After that, we get into the dysfunctional prefrontal circuitry, which manifests as your willpower being weakened, and you become hyper-reactive to the cues that trigger your behavior. And this is because your prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that basically governs your actions. It's where you plan things, evaluate consequences, costs, benefits, etc. And most importantly, it governs your willpower and tells you not to do things that you might regret later. And there are two types of pathways extended into our reward system from it. One of them says do it, the other says don't do it. So if the emotional centers in your reward system want you to hit somebody, the prefrontal cortex will be like, hey dear guy, let's think about this first. But with addiction, the pathways that encourage behavior become increasingly powerful, while the pathways that discourage and inhibit behavior become increasingly weak. It's literally like you've got, you know, the angel and the devil on your shoulder, but the angel's just a regular dude, and the devil's pumping steroids into himself. He's like Bane. And we found physical evidence of this in fMRI studies and also evidence through specialized psychological testing. And this can be reflected in at least 13 studies of pornography users. And then the last one, the malfunctioning stress system, which means that your cravings are stronger, your willpower is weaker, you've got a lot of withdrawal symptoms. This is because your stress system is a little bit more nuanced than just fight or flight. It also modifies your brain to protect itself from long-term stressors. And experts view addiction as a stress disorder because it not only affects your stress hormones uh, like adrenaline and cortisol, but it also induces several changes in your brain's stress system. And there are three changes in particular that make it extremely difficult to quit. The first is that stress increases dopamine and cortisol, which means that even something only slightly stressful can trigger your cravings, even if there's nothing to trigger it directly. The sensitized addiction pathways are already there and those in themselves are enough. The second one is that stress inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which means that your impulse control and ability to fully comprehend the consequences of your actions are both inhibited. And lastly, when you're addicted to something and you don't give it to your brain, your brain basically freaks out and your stress system goes into overdrive. This is what causes withdrawal symptoms like anxiety, depression, being tired, insomnia, irritability, mood swings, etc. If this sounds like you, take note of that. Remember, you're not depressed, you're just addicted to pornography. We've got three studies that demonstrate these dysfunctional stress systems in pornography users, and even one of them showed that it was epigenetically altering your stress genes. So to summarize these four neuroplastic brain changes, you're like, hey, this is epic. Your brain's like, yeah, do more. Your brain's like, no, this isn't epic. In fact, very little of anything is epic anymore. And then your brain's like, do more of the originally epic thing. And your brain's also like, I literally just can't even stop you at this point. And then collectively, no one's having a good time. Basically, you get the point. And coom brains used to be like, there's no such thing as porn addiction. No symptoms. We need studies. And so in 2017, we had two studies that confirmed these symptoms in pornography users. Another one just with internet addicts who were also pornography addicts. And then three more um, with escalation in tolerance as it pertains to pornography. And then another 14 more with that escalation into weirder genres, which is part of the tolerance aspect of pornography addiction. So basically, we say yet again, anyone who tells you that this isn't real or that it isn't a problem is a coping addict who should not be listened to. And this includes the DSM. For those unfamiliar, the DSM is basically a book full of flashcard terms that women who think they've had a hard time in life will pay $100,000 to memorize a fifth of so that they can supplement what you were describing with the professional language, which really just lets you know how smart they are. The DSM has long been criticized for being politicized with their practices. And this is, of course, because it's, you know, hard to look at things objectively when you're addicted to touching your own pee-pee, right? 
This is why they rejected the idea of hypersexuality, despite the fact that many others have described the reasons for doing so as illogical. But the American Society of Addiction Medicine has stated that there is no doubt that sexual behavior addictions are real and that addiction is a primary disorder which indicates underlying brain changes. And the DSM has even been criticized by Thomas Insel, Insel, who is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, precisely because they too often rely on political decisions, which simply defy reality. Might ring a bell with some other issues, but he even said that the DSM should no longer be considered the gold standard and that he was reorienting research from the N. IMH away from the DSM for exactly that reason. And also important to note is that the DSM hasn't been updated in 10 years. Do you know what's happened in the last 10 years? What's exploded in the last 10 years? Pornography usage, as we've discussed in terms of use, severity of use, distribution, et cetera. Like along with all the research proving that this is a huge problem, the DSM doesn't even care about that because the DSM is full of a bunch of degenerates. But that being said, they did come out with something in 2017 in which they tried to say that these types of problems were compulsive disorders instead of addictions. But the top neuroscientists in the world actually think that they should be recategorized as an addictive disorder because of the neurobiological similarities between it and other behavioral disorders. And this brings us to the difference between a compulsion and an addiction. People will basically cope by saying that anything you do, whether it's gambling or watching pornography or playing video games, all of those aren't addictions, but rather they're compulsions. And they do this because it makes them feel less guilty about being addicted to things, basically because they'll say that addictions can only be chemical addictions. The truth is that if you examine the neural correlates for a compulsion and an addiction, they're practically identical. Your brain doesn't know the difference. So any rhetoric suggesting that there is a difference is purely for obfuscation. It's a red herring. It's all the same to your brain, same sensitization, same changes, everything that we've discussed. And while we've been discussing all these problems, addiction in general, uh, a lot of people have probably been thinking, well, okay, it's bad for me. It can be addicting, but I still like it. So how much is okay? The problem with this is that it assumes the problem is binary. But like our friends on the left would say, it's actually non-binary, which means that it isn't as simple as just saying you're either addicted to porn or you're a casual. More importantly, the question of like, where do I draw the line ignores something very important that we've been talking about, which is the reality of neuroplasticity. The fact that your brain is always changing and adapting and learning in response to its environment. And with what we're talking about here, which are supernormal stimuli, it happens almost instantly. And this has been confirmed with studies on topics ranging from video games to junk food that have all found that it only takes a short pattern of use to change the composition and function of your brain. We've also got studies that unsurprisingly show relationships between porn consumption and addiction-related brain changes, and also that about a fifth of high school students who watched pornography uh, more than once a week experienced low sexual desire compared to 0% of those who were not watching it. So the takeaway is that you don't even have to be fully addicted for your brain to start changing and for you to start experiencing some of the negative effects of that. As you're getting older and you're learning, you're changing your sexual environment, all of that is going to affect your brain's functions, along with its priorities, its desires, perceptions, et cetera. It's not good. This is why I get this question a lot, especially after the last pornography video, which is, well, what about hentai? What about pictures? And it's like, dude, get a hold of yourself, man. Like, stop finding ways to give yourself permission. It's literally the equivalent of, well, I won't drink pot, but I'll eat chips. I won't play slots, but I'll play roulette. It's like, it's all the same. Your brain doesn't know the difference. All it knows is that it wants that stimulation because that's what you've conditioned it to want. And now that you know the conscious difference, your brain is literally trying to make you like give it that stimulation by having you convince yourself that it's okay. It's not the same. Yes, it is. Get a hold of yourself, dude. Dudes be talking about big government will never control me, but they can't go two weeks without watching cartoons have sex. Get a hold of yourself. Your purpose is greater than that. And I think we said this earlier, but I'll say it again. There are two types of people who watch pornography, people who are addicted and people who aren't addicted yet. The majority of people in the former category don't even know that they're addicted, which is what's so pernicious about it. People just need to be honest with themselves. But I do understand that it's significantly more difficult given that your brain has rewired itself to pursue that addiction. So again, there's no shame in this. But now that you know, now that you have this information, it's time to change. We'll go over some ways to do that in a second. But a few more things that I want to mention. First, um, one of which being that the last line of defense for many degenerate pseudoscientists is to play chicken versus egg, to basically be like, well, anyone who has a porn problem only has it because of pre-existing conditions. They were already depressed. They already had trauma, et cetera. And sure, some people have pre-existing conditions, but addiction will never manifest unless someone has engaged in chronic overstimulation. Also, there's no research to suggest that young people without those conditions can participate in that chronic overstimulation without developing symptoms. And we have to keep in mind that the best data for these types of things is going to be hard to find because it's going to require time that is very rare because it's a relatively young problem and also controls that are very rare because the problem has already become so widespread. But there was a longitudinal study done in California that tracked young internet users over time and it found that young people who are initially free of mental health problems but use the internet pathologically develop depression two and a half times more often. There was another one done in China which would be impossible to do 
duplicate here, they found that of 2,000 new students who had never had internet access before, 59 of them had developed an addiction um, already over the course of a year. It made them more depressed, more anxious, more hostile, more psychotic, and it was because of the addiction that those things happened to them. And the researchers also said that they couldn't find a solid pathological predictor for the internet addiction, but rather that the addiction would predict the pathologies that we just mentioned. And you might be thinking like, oh, 59, that's not even that bad. Sure, but that's after one year, after having basically grown up without it. Imagine growing up with it, using it every day, then finding out about pornography at an even younger age than that. And then they find out about the internet. It's like it hijacks the most powerful circuitry in your brain, et cetera. It's a huge problem. We can expect all the implications of the internet addiction to translate to pornography addiction. There was also a Taiwanese study which found a correlation between teen suicide attempts and contemplation and internet addiction, even when controlling for things like depression, self-esteem, family support, and demographics. There's also more research from China that shows that while these addicts exhibit definite signs of depression, such as loss of interest, aggressive behavior, depressive mood, feelings of guilt, etc., that they showed little evidence of these being permanent, which suggests that their symptoms are stemming from uh, their addiction rather than some underlying pre-existing condition. And there was another Chinese study done on a few thousand preteens that found that those who became addicted exhibited increased depression and hostility when compared with the non-addicted group, and also that those who began as addicts but were no longer addicted by the end of the year showed decreased depression, hostility, and social anxiety when compared with those still addicted, etc., etc. There are mountains of data backing this up. Even things like data from Belgium that found that as 14-year-old boys watch pornography, their academic performance declined six months later. The point of all of it being that we know that the internet makes you addicted and depressed, so from there, we can extrapolate, given everything that we've talked about, everything that we've learned everything that we already knew to say that pornography will end up being regarded as even more destructive and damaging and addictive once people start being more honest, basically, which will probably not happen because they benefit from you being addicted to it. But we'll get into that later because right now we're talking about symptoms and how your life will get better when you stop doing things to destroy yourself. And I want to highlight that. I want to... Mm, Symptoms like erectile dysfunction, social anxiety problems, concentrating, depression, while they're all different, they do share something in common in the literature, which is the brain changes due to sensitization and desensitization, and evidence of this has been found in even moderate pornography users. The fact of the matter is that dopamine signaling is very important, and declines in that signaling have been linked to diminished sexual behavior, uh, including sluggish erections and climaxes, decreased risk-taking and increased anxiety, combined with a tendency towards angry overreaction, which can altogether or even separately make you less willing or able to socialize, inability to focus, which can account for your concentration and memory problems, lack of motivation and healthy anticipation, which can lead to apathy, procrastination, and also contribute to depression. This is just really not good for you, man. There was even a guy who let researchers deplete his dopamine using a pharmaceutical just to see what would happen, and guess what happened? The guy lost his motivation, his senses were dulled, his mood was lower, he was fatigued, he couldn't concentrate, he was anxious, he was restless, depressed, all the stuff we talked about. And researchers have measured these declines in all sorts of addicts, including internet addicts, but there's good news, boys. The good news is that when your brain properly regulates its dopamine and its related neurochemicals, you're going to have a much easier time being sexually attracted naturally, socializing, being extroverted, generally feeling like it might actually get better. This has been shown in research, uh, what is it, after just like four weeks of abstinence from pornography, people are more willing to take risks, they're more extroverted, more conscientious, more altruistic, more able to delay gratification, less neurotic. I'm not saying that we should ban pornography. Last time I said that, people got triggered. However, in all of the scenarios where we save our country, pornography is banned. And lab coats will diagnose you with depression because your body is reacting to things that it wasn't designed to handle. They'll give you all the feel-good pills just to make you even more numb because they don't recognize pornography used to be a bad thing. So my brothers, just remember, you're not depressed. You're a pornography addict. You don't have erectile dysfunction. You're a pornography addict. There's no shame in that. The shame is not in the actions taken to get you to this state. The shame is in the inaction once you've realized how bad the state actually is. You weren't supposed to live like this. People were supposed to protect you and they failed. And really all we can do now is focus on making ourselves better and our society better so that two generations from now, our sons won't have to go through this and they'll actually have a society that they can be proud of because there won't be a bunch of depressed zombies like we are. And let's just be honest. I mean, like that's, that's basically where we're at. That's why I have a real soft spot for the boys. You know, obviously we love women, we cherish women, we love our seven percenters, but it's like I look at the men in this country, particularly the young men, and I recognize that the same blood that built the greatest civilizations in the history of the world, that fought and won the greatest battles in the history of the world, is flowing through like each and every one of us. Meanwhile, our country's collapsing. It is collapsing. And very few of us feel as though we actually have a purpose. It's just, it's heartbreaking to me. It really is. But 
You know, if you talk about that, that's toxic masculinity. That's why men are doing so badly all of a sudden in the last few decades. No, actually, it's not because toxic masculinity, because we can't talk about our feelings. It's because your kind needs us to be weak in order for you to be successful. And so you have displaced us, you have demoralized us, and as the logical consequences of those efforts manifest in front of you for the first time in recorded history, you blame toxic masculinity. Despite the fact that what you call toxic masculinity, when it was much more present in society, everyone was so much better off. It's these weak men, the slave morality. They need you to be weak with them because it makes them feel less insecure and because it makes you less threatening to the actualization of their worldview. That's ultimately all leftism is. It is the mass mobilization of the spiritually ill. That's why I never take any of it seriously. Well, the science says that you need to masturbate to pornography to relieve stress. Oh, you're not a porn addict? Have fun being more likely to get prostate cancer. Okay, addict. I'm just, I'm so done with the weak men. And I like, I don't mean like the beat down men, like the ones who are suffering and who need help. I mean the types who, instead of overcoming their weakness, they insist that everyone else is the problem. It's the ultimate cope. I have nothing to say to those people. I think you're a disgrace. I think that your ancestors are ashamed of you. All they sacrificed only for you to become a slave to yourself and to the oligarchs of society, to have no children and to instead derive your meaning from, from, pop culture and mass media, I find you repulsive. I think that your lifestyle is an insult to the greatness of the human experience. But that is of minor importance because me and the boys are going to break the conditioning and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. It's inevitable. The prerequisite to your worldview has been that man must lack the discipline that would prevent him from becoming a slave to his desires, which cloud him from realizing just how bad you've allowed things to become. That's why they hate masculinity. Masculinity is inherently right wing because a man is measured by how he controls things, most importantly himself. It's also a reflection of his character, having control, establishing order. These require strength, and this is fundamentally what masculinity is about. And people who don't like this channel and who don't like us, they'll say, John Doyle looks young because he's young and he's got glasses. What does he know about masculinity? And it's like, bro, you are literally addicted to watching Asian cartoon characters have sex. You're pathetic. And the reason they're like this, even ignoring the insecurities that define leftist thought and affiliation, is because their entire concept of masculinity is derived from pop culture. They think masculinity means like aggression, basically. They think of Marvel movies or they think of when they were bullied in school. And that's what they think masculinity is. And so they look at someone like me who's in pretty good shape, but obviously, you know, I'm not like this hulking, Bane-like figure. And so it just goes right over their head because they don't have the capacity to transcend these very sophomore conceptions of masculinity. And it's also because it makes them feel better about their own weakness, to be able to dismiss someone talking about the importance of everything that they lack, be it discipline, conviction, whatever. Just be like, ah, well, he looks like he's 14. That's like really what it comes down to because they have no actual concept of masculinity, which is related to why, you know, they think it's a social construct, that gender roles are fake and fluid etc. The truth is that there's nothing inherently masculine about aggression because if you don't have control over your emotions and you become aggressive, that's not masculine. Or a lot of times insecure men will use aggression to compensate by trying to embody this caricature of masculinity because again, they have no real concept. Aggression is good when it's rooted in a good man. Anything else is just bitchy chaos, essentially. And when we reestablish the order in our lives by cultivating discipline, we will realize something very alarming, which is that the people running things have hijacked and exploited our biological drives to pursue food and sex, and that has made us weak. And they've made a lot of money doing that. And they've gained a lot of power, too. And at the same time, they promote these ideas of freedom. That at least in America, we're free. China doesn't have freedom because pornography is illegal. Maybe that's true, but I'm not sure that it's exactly reassuring to know that, yeah, you know, they subsidize and enable our destruction, but hey, that's just a result of our freedom because that's what America's all about. Gosh darn it, getting fat and watching people have sex on an iPhone. Why do you think that's the narrative? Think about that. Why is it that when that is discussed in the mainstream, because it rarely is, why is it that when it is, it's always in a positive light? Why do you think our government has failed to address it? It's a coincidence. All the people who just so happen to want to destroy our country are also all overwhelmingly supportive of it. It's a very simple answer. And this is something to consider when you quit, how to properly structure the psychology of it. It's simply that demoralization is a warfare strategy. Pornography demoralizes you. It is a weapon. Treat it as such. Don't get depressed. Get angry. Channel what masculinity they have yet to rob from you into something productive. Take strong issue with the fact that pornography is an attack on men, which means that it's an attack on your sons and on your fathers, which means that it's an attack on the family. It makes men weak. It makes women resent them and vice versa. They don't even want to pursue women. It destroys relationships with women, lowers the fertility rates in our country. It traumatizes children. It's unequivocally an attack on the society, regardless of intention, and it should be treated as such. Why do you think the most popular pornography categories are incestuous? Why do you think that generations of young men have been programmed into wanting to have sex with the women in their family, who they're supposed to be protecting and looking after? Just a coincidence? Maybe, yeah. End result is the same, which is that the family unit is being sexualized and attacked. 
And those associations and attitudes, as we talked about, are being sculpted and neurochemically programmed into the minds of millions of young men. What's that going to look like in 30 years? I don't think I want to know. Those guys are going to be even worse off than we are unless we can do something about it. Otherwise, they're just going to be having an even worse time than us. And we can't do that to them because the fact of the matter is that, and I know this sounds weird, but it's true, like low-key everything about you as a man is like rooted in your sexual desire. That's ultimately like your driving force, which is why the iron law of sexually perceived history is that men did greater things when it was harder to see boobs. It's simply a fact. Everything we talked about earlier involving your brain, dopamine, the reward system, all of that has been compromised by this and it's destroying you. We walked through the science behind it. I don't want to repeat myself, but we all know it's true. Remember when guys actually talked to girls, even like 20 years ago, Remember the motif of every teen movie that came out before like 2010? For like 30 years, there was this sweet spot in Hollywood where it was degenerate enough to put this stuff on screen, but audiences weren't degenerate enough to where it wasn't interesting to them anymore, where you'd go see any teen movie and the whole problem was that the dudes needed to get with the girls. That was it. The motif of like, bro, I need to get laid now. And then you'd be in the theater like, bro, I know. But that's gone. Guys don't talk to girls anymore. Guys don't approach girls anymore unless they're like running game. And that's not insignificant. They've robbed you from even the simplest and greatest joys of being a young man, interacting with young women. Now it's just grooming you for the rat race. But work is meaningless, so give it meaning through consumption, constant advertisements, eat this food, buy this product, naked girl pretty, must touch pee pee. That's what's coming, not socialism. Remember, don't just consume to live, live to consume. You know it's true, especially young men, like the whole culture is different. Think about the first porn you saw. Now think about the weirdest thing that you've ever seen. Now think about what you're watching now on average. You know it's weird. Because you can maybe be like, yo, dude, I saw this video of this chick having sex. It was sweet. But you wouldn't be like, yo, dude, I saw this video of this chick getting raped by a squid. Same way that you'd be like, yo, dude, I went to this party. I got wasted. But you wouldn't be like, yo, dude, I can't function anymore without drinking throughout the day. Dap me up, bro. Bro, I'm addicted to furry porn. Dap me up, bro. The boys are not doing well. The boys are down bad. And you can't expect a society to survive more than a few generations of the boys being down bad. And this is so obvious. Do you think the people who hate us don't know this, that this is like lost upon them? You know what I would do if I were the guy who does things? I'd take a few decades and I'd just weaken the men of society by promoting a sedentary lifestyle that prioritizes comfort and convenience, all while promoting things like pornography, alcohol, marijuana, etc., to usurp the role of natural endorphins while simultaneously trying to just fry their reward center, lower their testosterone with the help of junk food that I'd also be promoting and subsidizing at the same time. Yeah, just basically getting men really weak, getting everyone to hate their bodies, be unhealthy, which would help breed the mental illness that I'm looking to breed since the health of the body and the mind are strongly related. And this would lower the self-control of the population too, which is a good thing for me because I need people susceptible to propaganda. And at that point, you just want to feminize the whole society so as to cement the collapse of the traditional male. Also, do the same with women, except just completely objectify them. Just make them into total whores. Convince them that it's empowering or something. They'll buy it, they're women. And then just go ahead and also promote sexual deviancy, which would logically result in the promotion of pedophilia in a long enough timeline. And then now you've destroyed the individual components of the family along with the family unit as a whole. That'll help you cement the perpetual childishness of the society. You're gonna want people basically distracted by superheroes and dogs and video games until they're in their like mid thirties, basically just dependent, not worried about starting a family, etc. For context, think about it this way. Imagine there's an emergency. You need somebody's help in a public place. What is the approximate age of somebody in 2021 that you look for to where you'd be confident that they could help you in an emergency? Now compare that to where you'd be confident like 30 years ago. I can tell you that I wouldn't be confident approaching anybody who appears to be under the age of about 37 to help me in an emergency. Anyone younger is too likely still effectively a child. They're too likely to have Peter Pan syndrome. Whereas 30 years ago, I'd imagine you'd be okay approaching anyone who appears to be like 25 or older. Maybe even younger, but yeah. Do that, destroy the family, uh, remove anything else that they might be compelled to care about, pride and country, God, heritage, all that. Replace it with celebrity worship, consumerism, aka money worship, literal Satanism. I don't know, it's all the same. But yeah, then at that point, you'd have a society filled with mentally ill people. They're insomniacs, they're anxious, they're depressed, they have mood disorders, they're committing suicide. At, the, at that point, it's so destabilized, they'll beg you. They will be begging you to take everything away from them just to bring about a sense of control and order into things. And then you're just good to go. You will have effectively bred and weaponized mental illness as a means of con <laughs> consolidating power. That's what I would do if I were the guy who does things. You know what this means? People are going to be like, oh, that you're the guy who does things? No, no. It means that there's no scenario where we survive if these trends continue. It just doesn't compute. Pornography, among many other things, breeds mental illness. And mental illness breeds leftism. It's unavoidable. 
And even that aside, let's get back into how it affects families because it makes you as a man less able to fulfill your role in that family. And that's basically because it makes you less of a man. And that's something important to internalize. Women want men who don't watch pornography. And that's not to say that you shouldn't do it because women don't want you to do it, but rather that not doing it will make you a better man and results in sleep. Women will be more attracted to you. Do you think women like actually like knowing that their boyfriends or husbands are getting off to other women? even ignoring that it makes your dick stop working. No, they don't. And frankly, they shouldn't be expected to. But society is preaching the opposite message. And so women have now just come to expect this of men. And they're told that, well, it shouldn't be a problem. And, you know, it can actually be something good for your relationship. That's a cope. And we'll explain why later. But the bottom line is that that in itself, even ignoring how many divorces and breakups can be traced back to pornography, I think it's like 56% of divorces are partially caused by it. But the fact that you as a man can't control yourself enough to prioritize your wife or even your girlfriend is a huge problem. And maybe you think it shouldn't even be a big deal because, well, they're not real women and you don't do it that often. And you've got all these logical reasons laid out. But look, man, you're not explaining this to me. You're explaining this to a woman. And if it makes her that upset, which it probably does, just get over yourself and quit doing it. Quit coping. Stop victimizing yourself. Like my girlfriend's trying to control me by saying it makes her upset when I watch pornography five times a week. A lot of guys are going to be right now, they're going to be like, bro, are you simping right now? And it's like, first of all, my dissertation on the psychology of the simp got over a quarter million views, which makes me the authority on this. Secondly, there's nothing epic about degrading women. And it's not white knighting to acknowledge that. And if you think it is, and you're probably just not in contact with a lot of girls, to be honest, it's the same reason why there's nothing good about women being in the military. Feminists have brainwashed women into thinking that it's like all empowering and weak men will be like, ha ha, how do you like it? Or something like that with pornography. And it's like, dude, do your job. As a man, whether you like it or not, your job is to protect and cherish women. Let me be very clear though. That applies to women, which means women who behave like women. I'm not saying these bitter, resentful feminists, these high T feminist types are worthy of that respect. But I'm also not saying that you should be worthy of respect as a man just because you're a man. Because if you're not willing to live up to those societal obligations, frankly, you're not a whole lot better. What does it say about a society that sends its women to die in wars or that whores its women out for the weakening of the masses, that grooms its daughters at very young ages to start producing pornography of themselves? That's not progress. That's abhorrent. It's your job as a man to stop it. And if you're not willing to do that, it's because you're weak or because you think it's funny or something. You should just start an OnlyFans too. Mix your SSRIs and your soy lattes every morning because you're just as bad as the women who are refusing to be women. That's why MGTOW is a cope. This movement of men who are like, grr, we're, we're mad at women, so we're just going to do our own thing. We're going to do whatever we want. It's like, dude, cool, I get that, but that's not what a man would do. That's what a boy would do. You're basically pouting. You're like, grr, girls are the worst. I don't need them. Whereas a man would just put them in their place. That's literally all you have to do. Just be a good man and nature will take over. The feminist conditioning will melt away. It happens every time. So just keep in mind, going forward, that's what you got to do that the only reason that women suck right now, particularly white women, is because men suck right now. So yeah, you can't just give up on women. Like, how do you think America survives without people, bro? We need families and we need children and we need them to be good. But in order for that to happen, we need our men to be good. And if you're a Christian, I ask you this very simply, how can you expect a God to put a good woman in your life if you yourself are not a good man? You have to earn her. It's that simple. Dudes be like, where's my trad GF? But then they're like 30 pounds overweight. They have a subscription to black.com. The point being that since we already know that married people are the happiest in, in their marriages, and it's actually the marriages that make them happier, and since we know that families are the backbone of society, we need you to be in a position to optimize the long-term stability and, and happiness of those relationships with women. We also need you to start pursuing women, etc. You know the list. We've gone over it like 10 times. Quit watching porn. Start kissing more girls. Are women annoying? Yeah, but we need them to make everything function. So we got to work together here. One, two, three, break. That's the game plan, 2007. But we have to go over a few more things starting with some of the common copes, the common copes of pornography endorsement. There's two things that we have to mention before we get into those. The first is that very few people will try to make the case that it's good for you. Most people will just say, what? No, it's not bad, which I think is even stupid on the surface because of how much of a change has occurred in society, how pervasive it is. Like the idea that it could just be neutral is stupid, but people will even say, well, it's positive for you. And that gets into the second thing that I wanted to mention, which is that I acknowledge that I might come off as apathetic or cold towards those who are coping to the people who are pro pornography. But the reason for that is very simply that the sympathy for them just doesn't exist. I just have no sympathy for those people. And it's because pornography is so obviously wrong and dangerous and harmful that any public endorsement of it can only be due to pernicious or corrupt intent. That's it. And that's repulsive to me. So yeah, I'm going to take it pretty hard on those people. Literally, I see no difference between them and the people who used to shill for the tobacco industry. And I actually think that these people are even worse. 
as it would turn out, though. The science is on our side. Basically, you've got these sex-positive psychologists who claim that there's no such thing as porn addiction, it's not bad for you, etc. And they always cite the same two studies from 2013 and 2015. And you'll find these two studies in any mainstream article you can find about, you know, oh, it's not real, it's not bad, whatever. The problem is that the results of those studies were actually in alignment with what we're saying, not what the coom brains are saying. Um, and many experts have come forward to say this, and we could break down exactly what they did incorrectly, you know, what they misinterpreted. My voice is getting tired, so I'll just say for now that no less than five peer-reviewed studies have come out proving that what they found in the 2013 study is actually in alignment with what we're saying, and then six for the 2015 study. So yeah, their information is garbage, which is why it's been excluded from recent reviews of the neuroscientific literature, and that's really all we have to say right now. Maybe another time we'll actually break it down, uh, their research, explain why it's bad, but for now we'll just state the fact that it's bad, which has been thoroughly corroborated by neuroscientific experts. Plus, we basically just explained the entire thing in the last hour or so. I mean, I became a neuroscientific expert the other day just to make this video. So yeah, sex positive psychologists take the L yet again. They've got two studies that they couldn't even do correctly because they were too focused on the next time they were going to go touch their pee pee. We've got like 40 neurological studies, like a dozen reviews of the literature, then 23 linking it uh, to making your pee pee stop working with about a fifth of those establishing causation then like 50 linking it to ruining your relationships and sex life and like 40 linking it to destroying your brain and making you depressed. And we just explained in detail the neurobiology and neuropsychology behind all of this because, like I said, I became an expert the other day. And the coom brains are seething. Coom brains on suicide watch. The boys take the dub yet again. And by extension, Western civilization as well. But actually, one thing we just mentioned, the fact that our PPs aren't working anymore deserves elaboration. I know we mentioned this really startling figure earlier, which is that there has literally been a thousand percent increase in erectile dysfunction in young men throughout the last 15 years. What could possibly be causing that? Because historically, like between 1948 and 2002, the rate was always at a casual like two to three percent, and it didn't start to significantly increase until you got to be about 40 or older. So what happened? The coom brains will say, well, it's because of unhealthy lifestyle choices, but not porn, but things like diet and substance abuse. The fact of the matter is that all of those trends have either decreased increased in the last 20 years or have not increased at a rate that would cause a thousand percent increase. Obesity is up like 4%. Drug use has been relatively stable in the last 15 years. Smoking is down, obviously, way down. Do we really need to guess? Some people say, well, no, it's actually because of anxiety and depression. That doesn't seem to be the case either. You've got studies showing that sometimes anxiety increases sexual interest by like 21%. Sometimes it decreases it by 28%. And the studies on depression and erectile dysfunction show that it's not the depression causing the erectile dysfunction, but rather the erectile dysfunction that's causing the depression. Plus, even if it were true, the disproportionate increase wouldn't square regardless. And another one that they'll say is, well, you have to watch porn because you need to know what you're doing because sexual chemistry is important. That's why you need to have sex on the first date. You need to see if you use sexual chemistry. Yeah, that's a cope. I almost feel bad for these people. They've ruined themselves sexually, just totally. If you have a high IQ, it means you're good at sex. I don't make the rules. It's not rocket science. You'll figure it out. And that's why it's a cope. You've got all these women like, wait a minute. Why didn't the guy who I let use me for my body care more about my sexual experience? What the heck? Because it's not that he was bad at it, sweetheart. It's that he didn't care about your experience because he has no respect for you because you have no respect for you, dummy. You played yourself whole. Now no one wants to marry you. Oops. <laughs> Highly religious married people have the best sex, by the way, and they don't even need to use these like elaborate accessories and, and fetishes because they haven't ruined themselves totally like you guys have. Also, the idea of sexual chemistry is a perfectly emblematic feature of the pathological narcissism that has polluted our culture. This idea of needing to derive a immediate physical pleasure in order to justify the existence of the relationship in whatever capacity. Here's the truth. You're going to get old eventually. Eventually, those experiences are going to go away. What's always there, though, is the character of the person, their commitment to you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that attraction and chemistry aren't important. I'm just stating the fact that sin makes women age like milk, which is why girls are coming out of college now looking like they're 35. So ironically, the women who act like whores in the name of sexual chemistry or empowerments or whatever are actually dilating the inlet in the hourglass of their natural beauty, which means that they're going to arrive at the inevitability of their sexual obsolescence much faster, and they won't even have anyone to be with by that point. All the good men will be with all the good women who are still just as graceful. But hey, you know, they'll have their cats, right? But anyways, there's a couple more. Uh, the idea that, oh, well, it's good for you because it decreases your risk of prostate cancer. First of all, this is just ad hoc justification. They want to promote pornography. They'll plug anything that they can think of in as the why. The end result is that it's going to be promoted. But the science on this is total garbage as well. Basically, it boils down to lab coats thinking that asking baby boomers to recall how many times they were masturbating every day each decade is actual science. And in 2016, there was a, a review done of all this data and it confirmed that it's garbage. And the last thing I want to go over here is actually more commonly something that you'll hear from people who are supposedly right-wing, and it's another ad hoc, which is pornography is free speech. That's not even remotely true. Washington didn't cross the Delaware so that your daughter could start an OnlyFans retard. Do you actually think it's about free speech? You think that all of the sudden, 
They're concerned about free speech. They barely let us talk about politics. That's our First Amendment. But you think they really care about the Bill of Rights when it comes to pornography? No, they don't. But they know what it does to you. And they know that once the country is completely demoralized, they can do whatever they want to do without impediment. So keep that in mind. If you are okay with pornography because you support free speech, eventually your free speech will be completely gone. I mean, look at the last 15 years as an example of that trend already already manifesting. So that's that. Now I want to go over a few of the most common questions that I was asked after posting the last video on the subject. And the first one is, what can I watch if not porn? Is hentai okay? Are pictures okay? Etc. And the first thing I need to say is that if you're watching hentai or anything adjacent to that, I can't help you. You need to be institutionalized. That's a joke, but seriously, the answer is nothing, frankly. And the reason for that is that your brain is still adaptive and those pathways that you've conditioned are still sensitive. And basically anything that you do to stimulate those pathways, even remotely, is going to eventually cause you to relapse and get right back to where you don't want to be. It It'll just reinforce and strengthen those things that we're trying to break you free of. And right off the bat, you need to understand that the reason you're trying already to find these loopholes to just totally quitting is because your brain has become structured to make you want to just keep going down this rabbit hole. So you need to just accept that in order to liberate and improve yourself and get yourself back to normal, you can never watch or view any type of pornography again. Seriously, hear that, internalize it, get comfortable with that knowledge. And it might even make you upset to hear that. Because that is your brain reacting to something that it regards as literally central to its existence. But we can't sugarcoat these things. If you want to be free, then it all goes. No exceptions. That gets into the next question, which is something to the effect of, well, what if I just don't watch it as often? What if I just decrease? You know, it's the same. It's like the same answer to the same question, basically. Like anything that you do to activate those pathways that you've created will just strengthen and reinforce them and will eventually get you right back to square one every time, even if that weren't the case. Remember earlier, we cited research proving that even minor exposure to these types of stimuli will alter your brain's composition because it's not about the level of consumption, it's about the pattern of consumption. And that pattern will inevitably lead to greater addiction. It's a rabbit hole with one axis. You can either go deeper or you can get out of it. There's no alternative. And the last question is, do I have to stop masturbating in general? And I think that question presupposes that masturbating is like something that's actually important in your life. What you'll find if and when you quit pornography is that masturbation really isn't necessary. And that's not to say that you don't get horny, but like you'll find out that the reason that you were masturbating so much is because of pornography, not because you just had those urges and then you used pornography to supplement them. That's kind of like the opposite of true. And it's also an issue of activating those pathways because even without porn initially, it could cause you to relapse. So I would say best move is just to totally detox for as long as possible. Plus, to be honest with you, masturbation is kind of cringe and that's probably an explanation for a later time. But basically, as a man, I feel like masturbating is the equivalent of like going to a movie by yourself. Like, yeah, you enjoyed it, but you know, you look like a loser. You know, it would have been better with a girl. You never want to be caught at a movie by yourself. Just like you never want to be caught masturbating. It's one to one. So what's the solution? Find a wife because then she has to have sex with you and she has to go see movies with you. Those are the rules. Problem solved. Oh, but I can't find a wife. Yeah, because you're too busy touching your pee pee. Get it together, my friend. The window is closing. You're about seven years away from not being able to find a woman who hasn't produced some form of pornography of herself. So act quickly. Plus the mainstream narrative is that masturbation is good for you. It's healthy, all that rhetoric. And I think a general rule that will serve you well is to just pay attention to what is being pushed the hardest by the institutions that are the most likely to be run by people who hate this country. And then just do the exact opposite. Vice News says I should be masturbating. Cool. I'm never touching my dick again. Not even to pee. Here's a red pill. When you don't consume the toxins of the satanic media, you actually don't even have to pee anymore, like physically, because your body will be able to just filter itself adequately. Few know this. But anyways, uh, there's more specific answers to more specific questions online. You can find those at your own accord. There's also a lot of good strategies and advice for quitting, but I was asked to give my advice, and so I will. I'd also advise you, though, to do some research on it yourself um, because there's more information out there. But I'll start with a very basic point, which is that you have to want to quit. You really have to want it because it's going to come down basically to willpower. And the way to do that is to psychologically frame it properly. You need to understand that what you're fighting against is a weapon. It is something that has taken control over you. It is a weapon that is against you, against your family, against everything, your country. You need to beat this. So think about that. When you see the ads, when you see girls being promoted on TikTok, Instagram, understand that is all designed to get you to relapse and to control you. It is a weapon. It's a strategy. Whether intentionally or not, that's the effective purpose. It doesn't matter if it's because they want to destroy the country or because they want to destroy you personally or they just want the ad revenue. End result is the same. This needs to make you angry, not depressed, not defeated, angry. That's the proper psychology. List all the damage that pornography has done to you, everything that you hate about yourself and your life that can be traced back to pornography. Crush it into the ground with your heel. Understand that you are being prevented from flourishing. Understand that you are destroying yourself. You will never get a good woman with this pattern of behavior. And if you have one, she won't want to be with you for much longer.
You weren't supposed to live like this. View yourself as what you are, which is a man who is inexorably flawed. View yourself as innocent and in need of protection. Picture yourself as a child. Find a picture of yourself as a child. Understand that you are still that person. You still need to protect that person. Every time that you participate in destructive behaviors, you are hurting that child. You don't want to do that. And while you're going through the family archives, print out a picture of your great grandfather. Hang that up next to the picture of you as a child and understand that if he were here right now, he would break your teeth with his belt upon seeing you lower yourself to such a level. Is that the type of man that you want to be? Is that the type of man that your ancestors sacrificed for, the men who came before you sacrificed for so that you could be weak? No, get a hold of yourself. And as far as how to do that, I have a few things. Firstly, you need to avoid things that trigger you, especially in the first stage of it. Remember, your triggers aren't just going to be pornography. They're going to be environments, activities, all sorts of things. So here's a good way to reduce this. Think of the most common places where you usually watch pornography and avoid those places for at least two weeks, no matter what. No exceptions. You do it in your bed. Guess you're sleeping on the couch. But I can't sleep on the couch. Yeah, you can. Tell your family you're experimenting with something because you're trying to reset your spine or something. I don't know. They'll believe it. The point being that you need to be honest with yourself. You need to figure out where it happens the most and then avoid those places no matter what for at least two weeks. Try to keep yourself out of the house. Go on walks, go to the library, wherever you have to go. Stay occupied, stay out of the house as much as possible because if you're just sitting at home bored, your cravings are going to be a much bigger problem for you. You also need to avoid visual triggers. For this, I would recommend staying off social media, the internet for at least two weeks. All it takes is one e-thought on Instagram to make make you relapse. The algorithms are designed for that. They're designed to get young men addicted to pornography so they can profit off ad revenue. You need to detox from it. Plus, social media in general is just terribly toxic, so you'll be much happier anyways. And you can even use this to, you know, like give your devices to your parents or whatever, or your girlfriend. Just be like, hey, I want to stop using social media so much. Is it cool if I give you my phone or my laptop or whatever? I can only use it in front of you if I have to answer a text or an email or something. And they'll just be like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. You'll be good to go. No internet access means no pornography. Or you could just tell them the truth, like straight up, if you trust them. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this with your parents because parents tend to be pretty out of touch. So if you tell them you're struggling with pornography addiction, uh, they're just going to like assume that you're watching it like five times a day or something, or you're watching like really weird material. And maybe you are, but you know, the point is that this problem really is generational. And if you think they'd be helpful, by all means, tell them. But if you don't, then you don't have to, because it's ultimately going to come down to you and your will and your resolve. And the best employment of that will and that resolve is to just simply stop touching your dick. It's that simple. In practice, it's a lot harder to do, but the method is that simple. If you don't touch your dick, you'll be fine. You know what I'm talking about. You know, guys like to touch their dick recreationally. It's just what we do. But with great power comes great responsibility. And if you can't touch your dick responsibly, then you'll have to hang up the suit. Every relapse can be traced back to touching your dick. So if you don't touch your dick, you'll be okay. And I think there's also, <laughs> I think there's also something to be said about punishing yourself with something that's ultimately good for you. So for example, If and when you relapse, tell yourself that every time you relapse, you're going to run two miles. Every time you watch porn, you have to run two miles. And if and when it happens, you'll have that guilt and that clarity afterwards. You know what I'm talking about. You'll need to channel that into something. So how about literally running two miles? Working out in general helps with this too because it occupies your time, makes you confident, disciplines you. But seriously, hold yourself accountable to that because it'll be easier to do that at first than it will be to quit pornography. Every time you watch it, run two miles, keep a pace. You'll feel a lot better afterwards, even if you hate running. But the last thing I'll say is that I have mixed feelings about tracking progress. I think there's something good about working towards a higher number of days. I think that helps. But there's also the fact that if and when you relapse, that framework makes you more compelled to just binge because it's like, well, I won't be breaking as long of a streak now if I binge for a few days. That's not good. Also, something to keep in mind is that the whole framing of like keeping track of milestones sort of implies that this is a big part of your life or that it's worthy of that mental volume or there's, you know, I don't know. There's utility to that, but ultimately you want to work towards a state to where you don't even have to think about it because it's just not a part of your life anymore. And of course, as a man, there's only so much that you can do there. Um, You get what I'm saying though. Bottom line is that you have to quit. The specific technique by which you do it is less important, but you do have to quit because our society is dying. It is dying. And history suggests that we should be able to bounce back from this, but the difference now is that our men are demoralized. They're weak, they're completely pacified, and never in the history of the world has this been the case. That's what's different. And if we don't do something to change that, we're just on our backs with our necks exposed, begging for mercy that we know won't be given to us. And it starts with you. You watching this right now, be that change. Send this video to all the guys you know, even if you don't know if they're struggling with this, they probably are, but still, it's like, this is the single biggest problem that we face because it makes us less able to deal with all of our other problems. It literally robs you of your manhood, your spirit, everything about your essence as a man, and it needs to be crushed into the ground and buried forever. It's the only way for us to take our country back. It is a necessary step. And I hope I've explained it adequately, 
Uh, you know, it makes you weak. It corrupts you. It corrupts your children, destroys families. It's nothing less than an attack on our civilization, and we have no choice but to treat it as such. So if you're still watching, thank you. The future's ours. Me and you, big guy, still have a lot of work to do, starting with ourselves, as expected. Hey, guys, if you like this video, leave it a... You know, I will say that I'm kind of glad that this is the last video that was recorded in the studio. Everything about it, I think, I mean, you know, I take pride in what I do. I think this was really well done. I think that that's why it took so long to do. Um, oh, man, I am so fried. I've never been so exhausted mentally. My arms hurt. You know how when you wear like a suit for a long time, your arms kind of hurt your shoulders? Bro, I'm glad. This is the way I wanted to go out in this studio. I have I get sentimental about things and I really like this little setup here. I think it's it's very humble, you know. It was very obviously put together <laughs> impulsively from amazon.com purchases with not a whole lot of education as to what is being purchased and why. But uh so I guess I don't know. I'll, just, I'll I'm saying this right now because what we're doing right now with going to Texas is representing a big change in the direction of HOC and the things that we're looking to do and it's going to be really positive and I'm very excited about it. But uh, these are the humble roots. And so I'm glad because, you know, I, I've said this before. The reason I got involved with this isn't because I wanted to talk about fiscal policy and, and you know, radical Islamic terrorism and these kind of like basic outdated conservative issues. I really just kind of care about the boys. <laughs> Honestly, like, I'm, dude, men are not doing well right now. I care about that family structure, things like that. And uh, pornography is is one of the biggest problems facing that, as we've discussed. So... Yeah, I'm really glad that we could do this video. I'm really glad that we could do it so thoroughly. Thank you guys for being patient with me. Thank you for watching all the way through if you're still here. Thank you for watching the channel in general, supporting the channel. We've got big things planned. I'm very excited about it. Um, but yeah, I'm fried right now. Voice is gone. Ugh. But this is how we wanted to go out. So yeah, like, thumbs up, subscribe, video, friend, share, no notifications, all that good stuff. Ugh. You think we weren't about to have a two, three minute outro on a video that's probably like, what, how long have we been going? Hours. This is the longest video in the history of the channel. Going out with a bang. I'm taking a break though, because I have to, you know, build a new studio, get settled in. So uh, you won't hear from me for a second. You would if I had Twitter, but I got kicked off because I told people to call their congressman. What are you going to do? So thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. I have it on good authority that it does in fact get better. So we'll see you then.